Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our information session on the BSc in Information Technology Program. Today's session, we're going to talk to you about the newest and most affordable BSc in Trinidad and Tobago. And to do that, I'll be joining you. My name is Ravi Raghunath. I'm the Executive Director of CTS College, and I'll be here with you for at least an hour or so as we discuss the program. As I indicated earlier on, feel free to ask any questions you may have as we go along. Please call me Ravi as well. So what will we be covering in an information session? Well, some of the things we look at is why study a BSc in information technology? And if you're going to study the BSc, there are options available in Trinidad. Why study with the University of Bedfordshire? And why even study with CTS College? What are the features of the program? Um, what would I learn in this program? How will this fit into my life? Because I have a busy life. I, I need to have a work, I have my job, I have a family, et cetera. How will this program fit into my busy life? What kind of support will this school give? Where will I graduate? Am I eligible to study? What are the entry requirements? How much will this cost? And when do I start? Right? So those are some of the things we'll cover. And we also have a special offer for you all as well that we will talk about during the course of today's session, okay? So why study a BSc? Well, for many of you, any one of you want to indicate what you're hoping to achieve when you finish your studies, what are you, what is the, your main reason for, for studying the program? What it is you're trying to get after? If you don't mind anyone hoping to share, is it like a better job, a promotion or something like that? What is this you're hoping to get? A better job and personal growth for me. Understood, right? Yeah. Yeah. Upgrade your skills. Got your change of career. Excellent. You know, guys, often when we ask these questions and we've been doing information session now for quite some time, and in terms of the feedback that we typically get, whether it's a master's or undergraduate, what, the reason why people are studying often is for the following reasons. So most people, most people are studying because they're looking for promotion, a salary increase, a change in career right, to start or grow their own business, some for personal achievement as well, some of it is because they want the practical experience in IT, and apart from that, right, the whole thing is about them enhancing their employability, so that's some of the reasons why you study, okay, now, often we look at education, and what we focus on is the cost, but I want to also recognize that while there is a cost, and we're not blind to it, but I also want you to recognize the many doors that have been opened, right? My own story as well as a testimony of, you know, how education has really changed my entire life because I came from a very poor family, but the fact is, is that, you know, I was the first in my family, it was nine of us to graduate, but um, at the same time, the, the options and the, the opportunities presented to me because I had my degree really was a life-changing, not just for me, but for my, my family, and even for my own, my own children as well, my own child, right? So I want to share with you as well, sometimes when you think about an education, don't just think about yourself only, but think about even your future generation and how it can, can impact even those around you. So it is a cost, but that cost is really an investment, and that investment could pay dividends later on. I want to do a small comparison, and I want to use a comparison here using CSEC, and the bachelor's degree. Now, this is an OJT chart, right? You're familiar with the on-the-job program, right? And this is what they currently pay. And I want to look at an example of someone who has CSEC passes and someone with a bachelor's degree. And I want to show you just using this, how a degree is really a big difference. So now we know that there are much more higher paying jobs than OJT, right? But at the same time, using the OJT salary range, a person with CSEC will get $3,025 a month versus a person with a bachelor's degree will get $7,562.50 a month. On generally, how much more is that from CSEC with a, with a bachelor's degree? How much more will you earn in one month? Roughly $4,500 more, right? Just over $4,500 more. I don't think many of us ever really stood down to consider the option of how much more we could achieve in our lifetime if we switch to a degree as well, right? Now, a degree, I want to make it clear, a degree doesn't guarantee that you'll get a job, but it simply opens up more and more opportunities for you, right? So how much more would you earn with a bachelor's degree versus CXC passes in a given month? As an OJT employee, you'll earn over $4,500 more in one month. How much more will that be in one year? So in one year, if you multiply that by 12, right, you would earn over $54,000 more. 
in one year alone, you would have covered the entire course of your degree, right? You know, so so one year of I'm thinking the the at the difference in course would have paid back already for that investment. But you're not going to work for one year and retire, right? Most people work for what 40, 45 years or so. Some people work for more, right? Now let's use the average now that if you work over 40 year period, over 40 year period, look at how much more you would have earned. 40 multiplied by that there is over $2 million more you would have earned. And that is assuming that your salary stay fixed for the entire duration of the 45 years or the 40 years. But we know that salary will change over time. We also aware that in most cases, your salary with a degree will change at a much more rapid rate than as someone with just CSEC passes, right? So given that's the case, you know, like general estimates is over 6 million more you would earn in your lifetime with a bachelor's degree versus with, with, with just CXC passes. Now, you imagine that your investment is making or paving the way for such a golden opportunity as well. Again, I'm, I, this is not a promise. I want you to understand these are figures, these are estimates, right? We cannot guarantee what the job market will be like, et cetera, but we know that it's extremely competitive and in order to compete, you would need to have, you know, to be better equipped as well. Good. So when you look at it, it's a compelling story to really seriously consider doing a bachelor's degree. Good. Now, based on that now, why study with the University of Bedfordshire? For many people, they've probably never heard of Bedfordshire simply because it's not what one of England's famous cities or anything like that, right? Well, Bedford is actually the name of the, the, the city. But given that's the case, there's no football team in the English Premiership called Bedfordshire or anything like that. So you may not be familiar, but if I tell you Liverpool or Manchester or Chelsea or things like that, you'll be a bit more familiar with those places, right? Okay, but given that's the case, I'll just share with you a little bit of the history of Bedfordshire. The University of Bedfordshire is a modern university with a, with a heritage going back to over 100 years. They are newer university, honestly. Now, you might be familiar in Trinidad, particularly the more mature persons in today's session will know that early on we had like John, John D. the Technical Institute, right? And San Fernando Technical, and they eventually became part of UTT. So they moved from being a technical institution to a university status, right? And the same thing with the University of Bedfordshire. They didn't start as a university. They started as a polytechnic institution that eventually became a university. They're one of the younger universities, honestly, and a younger university is really under 100 years, right? So although their heritage goes back to more than 100 years, they're a university for less than 100 years. They have more than 20,000 students currently from over 120 different countries. Definitely a global place of learning. In the UK, they have five campuses, one in Luton, one in Bedford, one in Potteridge, one in Alsberg, and one in Milton Keynes. So five different locations or campuses within the UK. But as any good business as well, what they started to do as well, they started to look elsewhere because the competition within the UK became very much, I mean, a lot of UK persons studying in the UK are not from the UK as well. Eh? They're from different countries. So they started partnering as well with partners in China, Middle East, Europe, Asia and stuff. And eventually they moved to the Caribbean. So Trinidad and CTS College became one of their first institutions they partnered with on the Western side of the UK. All of the other places on the Eastern side of the UK. So in Trinidad, there are three schools offering University of Bedfordshire programs, ourselves, CITAL and Shell. And in Guyana, there's a school called Nations University offering Bedfordshire program. And they're looking at partnering with a school in St. Lucia as well. So they are, and, and they, that, num, that number of partners is eventually going to grow also, right? So they are partnering with more and more schools. And it makes sense as a business because now with their programs being available online, now they could broaden their reach to almost anywhere in the world. Right, they ranked in the top six percent of, of universities worldwide, and they also won the Queen's Anniversary Prize in 2013, which is a big national recognition in the UK. Right now, having said that, why study at CTS College? Now, I'll tell you a little bit about CTS College as well. Right, so CTS College is a private tertiary provider. We've been in the education industry for over 20 years. We are ACT recognized, and we offer a range of programs from from primary. In fact, we just started preschool, primary, secondary, tertiary, where we offer diplomas, bachelor degree, and master's program as well. And we're looking at eventually offering a doctoral program also, right? And we offer a range of professional development programs called micro certifications. So that's a little bit about CTS and our offering. 
The next slide, however, is what I will call our bragging slide. And it's something I'm really proud about because our students, our lecturers, our staff has made us really proud. CTS College started as a really tiny school. And if I share with you our story briefly, we just had like 18 students in our first year. It, we, we didn't, we were running at a loss for the first couple of years, but like any person or any entrepreneur, you'll know that sometimes it takes a while for business to grow and develop and mature. And, but we continue to persevere and the feedback from the student was really always very good. So we start, we were growing every year and eventually we started moving from just like um, computer literacy training and stuff like that to tertiary programs. And as we grew, we started winning world prize and world prize is given to the student who was the top student in the world in a given subject. So for example, AB is offered in over 30 something countries in the world, right? With over 200 and something different schools offering the AB program. And this tiny school in Chagorn is winning our world prize for the top student in the world. That was a remarkable achievement for us. Well, I remember that first day when we won a world prize. Well, since then we've won 96 more world prize. In fact, we re in the last five years, CTS College has won more World Prize than any other school in Trinidad and the Caribbean as well. We also have the record with AB for the school that has won the most World Prize in one sitting. The previous record was, I think it was seven or eight World Prizes a school had won. We shattered that record and we won 15 World Prizes and that was three years ago. It was an amazing accomplishment for us. We've also won 47 university awards with the University of Hertfordshire given to the top student. Now I want you to know, the university is comparing the performance of students on campus, students in, who are directly enrolled with them online, as well as students at all their different partners. And every year we have been winning the student award with the University of Hertfordshire, right? And then apart from that, we've won EBME awards. And what has been for you might make more sense we won 11 ACTT awards. ACTT had something called held an annual award service called the Quiet Awards. It stopped a few years ago because of budgetary constraints, right? Because it was a function they held, they gave prizes and all of those and all of those costs. So they stopped it. But while the, while the awards function were held during that period, we won more ACTT awards than any other school in the country. We won six student awards for student support service, excellence in student support services. That's a remarkable achievement because to me, that's about the kind of support you're going to get at CTS College. So that should say a lot to you as well. Um, we won three for excellence for an established quality management system and two for teaching and learning. Now, when we are winning these awards, we are competing with the giants and more established schools like UE, UTT, Costat, Roytech, you know, and University of Southern Caribbean, et cetera. SBCS farms, et cetera. So it's really a humbling experience to win an award against all those giants of institutions. So this means a lot to us as well. Um, now we've had over 14 years of experience delivering the BSc program. So we have an average pass rate of BSc IT program. We have an average pass rate of over 85% per module. There are over 2000 students who have passed through our hands right? Over 1,700 students graduating with over 400. Well, actually that number has crossed 500 now with first class honors. And our students are employed in various sectors at different levels as well. Now, we, when we started offering a BSc, we started with the University of Hertfordshire, but eventually we were looking at offering a full three-year program, but the University of Hertfordshire, their pricing was way too high for the local market. So after trying to negotiate, we, we, could not negotiate on a price that was reasonable enough for the local market, right? And therefore I had to look elsewhere. So we mutually agreed, look, we, we you know, we had a dead, deadlock and we can't get a pricing that to me would be suitable for the local market. So I started searching elsewhere. But what I did was I got the views of thousands of students in terms of what they wanted in a bachelor's degree. And I don't know if this makes sense to you, but these are some of the things that students wanted the most when they were looking at a degree. So one, they wanted a program that was fully accredited because if they had to travel to different countries, they wanted a program that was recognized by employers locally, as well as they wanted a program that they could have done if they had to migrate to Canada, America, wherever, it will be recognized there as a recognized bachelor's degree. Students, many of my students also had to travel for work. And because they were in and out, et cetera, they wanted to continue their study and not be disrupted because they had to go on a, a work trip or something like that. So they wanted a program that was globally accessible so that they could access at any time of the day, et cetera. So 
we that was another item in our shopping cart that we were looking for, right? Or wish list, if you want to call it that. Employers, now we also lease with employers and employers were saying, you know, we were hearing the complaints of employers from the past about employers complained. And you'll see many articles in the, in the newspapers where they felt degree persons just had degree, but they have no, they only know theory and they don't know how to apply the theory. So they wanted people who were more practical. So they felt degrees should be more practical. So we looked for a program that was more practical, right? We also, a lot of our students are working persons as well. And they are simply trying now to get a promotion at work, but they need to have a bachelor's degree. So in order to compete, they wanted to get their the bachelor's degree in the shortest possible time. In fact, if they could have gotten it tomorrow, they'll gladly take it as well, right? So they wanted a program that was accelerated that they could qualify or complete their degree in the shortest possible time. And also from all of us, we want something that will fit our pocket. So based on some of those and other factors as well, we created a wish list and we started shopping around, looking for a program that will match all of those. We met with many programs. Some of them were like the top schools as well. But the reality is that if it might be real good in one, but horrible in the other, like they might have a really high price, but meet some of the other needs. And in the end, I needed something that met all of them. And finally, I got to University of Bedfordshire. And that is how now we were already delivering their MBA. But the thing is, is that it didn't mean that we need to do their bachelor's degree. So after careful consideration, right, we chose theirs because they were the only one that met all of these, right? Of course, it required a bit of tinkering with their program to deliver it. So here's how it does. So I'm going to discuss each of these today and tell you how the program satisfies those. So the first one is the program is fully accredited. So in the UK, it's recognized by, so, and right, so in the UK, sorry, QAA is the awarding body or the body that is used there to, to recommend universities to the, to the Queen or, or whatever, right? So in order to become a university and to be given that power to grant degrees, you must first be given that by the government. And in order to do that, QAA basically makes the recommendation. So the University of Bedfordshire is recognized by QAA. Right, and that is how it was granted degree status. And QA does frequent um, reviews as well. So not just because you qualify, it means that's it for the rest of your life. Nope, you have to go through periodic reviews to ensure that your quality remains at a very high level, etc. Apart from that, the university is also ACTT recognized. So therefore, in Trinidad, it's recognized by ACTT. Right, and so therefore, you can feel assured as well that your program is, you know, of good standing. So in, this is part of the international recognition program, right? Now, apart from that, the fact that it's, it's um, fully accredited, what it means for us is that all our marketing promotion, all our admission like, must, be, must go through the university. So for example, when you apply, CTS cannot accept you. The university is the one who have to accept you. And only when they accept you, then you, become, then you can enroll in CTS, right? With CTS to complete your degree. So all admissions, all our lectures are approved by the university. All the teaching material are set by the university. Of course, we have the option to customize them, but they set the material and we could customize accordingly. All assessments are set by them and they do annual audits and they also do continuous feedback with students as well to ensure that you get, they get proper feedback to improve their processes as well. The program is also globally accessible. And what this means is that, as I indicated to you, there are students from all around the world enrolling in the, with the university doing their programs. Some are doing it purely online. Some are doing on campus in the UK or at various satellite sites in different countries or through educational partners, right? But what the university also does to support such a, a group, they have an online learning environment called Brio. So Brio is your online learning environment. When you log in, you'll be able to view your course, the materials for your course. You will view assignments and stuff. You could you will view your assignment. You could upload your assignment also on Brio. So all your assignments are submitted there. You don't have to print and bring anything to CTS. Anywhere in the world you are, you could access Brio and you could upload your assignments from anywhere. And it's a, you have access to this 24-7. So you could study at any time of the night, any time of the day, your choice, of course. So that's one of the advantage the environment brings to you as well. Apart from that, right, the program is practical. So throughout the entire program, you are going to be solving real life challenges. You're going to be developing solutions. So for example, from level one, you are developing, right now my students are building in level, in, in year one, which is level four, they're currently doing a programming course where they're building a, 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 an app 
which is a taxi booking application like Uber and that sort of thing. So they're doing something like that in year one. They have multiple assignments here. So that, that is one example of an app that they're building and they're building another one in another unit, right? They're also doing database design and stuff like that in year one. In year two, you're building an e-commerce system. You're also developing um, like um, solutions to solve. So you have to find a problem in Trinidad right, or in any way in the world, and you have to develop now a solution for it. So some students have developed solutions for COVID, some students have developed apps for different to solve different problems as well, like it could be a problem at work with employee related or healthcare related. It's in whole different industries, they are solving problems as well. So they are coming up with solution. And of course, in the final year, you have a project or your thesis to do, and for that, you also have to build uh, for that right now, our, our current focus is building an e-commerce application for that, which is a higher level than the one they would have done previously, right? So that's some, some example of the practical skills they would be getting in the program. They will learn about networking. They will learn about um, creating database solutions as well, designing interfaces, et cetera. So they are learning a lot of different practical skills in the course. So therefore, it's a practical bachelor's degree, right? Now, the program is accelerated, and I'll tell you what we do in order to, to, to make it accelerated. In the UK, the program is done over three years, but what, how it works is that every year is made up of three semesters. Now, I indicated to you as well that a lot of foreign students come to the UK to study. So what typically happens is that the student will do start in September, they will do their first semester from, from September to Jan, and then they'll do their next semester from Jan to May, and then from May, they will go home to their families and stay for summer. So May to September, they will typically go home and then return to the university again in, in late September for the next semester. So that is typically how it works. Although there are three semesters, the students study two semesters and then they basically go home for an, an entire semester. What I indicated to the university is that the, in Trinidad it's a little different. We're not a large country like the UK and we don't have a lot of foreign program, foreign students in the country, meaning that where they just come in to the country to study and then they have to go back home. So most of our students in that regard, we don't need a four month break. If a student wants to take a break, they can, but why not allow students after they completed the two semesters to move on to the next level? And they agree to it. So the intent therefore is that yes, in eight months you finish one or two semesters, which is eight months you finish one level, then you go on to the next level. In another eight months you finish that next level and then in another eight months, you go on to the next. And based on that, you, you would be able to complete the degree in two years. So that's typically how it works. So each level, for level four, level five, level six, there are four subjects in each level. The bridging program is, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the bridging program, but there's only one subject in the bridging program. But for level four, five, and six, you do what you do four subjects in total, but you're not doing all four one time. You're doing two subjects in one semester and two subjects in the next semester. And you finish in, in two semesters, you go on to your next level. And that's simply how it works. So based on that, we were able to convert the program into an accelerated program where you could finish in two years, starting from level four, right? So we didn't cut down the, the duration of a semester or anything. All we simply did was remove the holiday period of four months in year one, four months in year two, et cetera, and allow you to finish in a shorter possible time, okay? So this gives you the option to complete your degree in two years. Now, in terms of the program now, we look for the most affordable investment. You are doing a UK program, and I'll share with you later on the price of this program in the UK and how we were able to negotiate to get a really good fee for students as well. And apart from that, we so I'll discuss pricing later, but apart from that, we also partner with GMMB to assist students in getting loans as well. So you can take a student loan to assist you with your degree as well. So let's look at how the program is structured now. So based on this, there are three levels, level four, level five, level six. To start level four, right? Ideally, if you did A-levels or you, you have IT work experience or your IT certifications, you can get in here. But apart from that, you could also get into this program if you have general work experience. So please note, if you have any general work experience, general work experience means it doesn't have to be in computing. You could have done human resource management. You could have worked as a taxi driver. You could have done so many different things and you could get in because it's all part of work experience and building maturity as well, right? So please note, if you have general work experience, you could also get in into level four, right? Now, 
apart from that, if you did any other qualification, so you didn't do your levels or any of those, but you did any other program too, you could get in, right? Sometimes they allow mature candidates as well to get in directly into level four. To get to level five, you could either pass level four and move to level five, or you could enroll directly in level five. Level five is what we call year two, right? And you could get in directly into level five if you have, for example, two or more years IT work experience and you have some IT certifications, then you can start at level five. And of course, you could to get on to level six, you could complete level five and move on to level six. Or if you, you did any IT program before, whether it's at an associate degree or higher HND program, right? So for example, if you did the the um the program at, at SBCS, the HND at SBCS, or you did a, your associate degree at COSTAT, or you did the diploma at UTT, right? Or you did your diploma at NESC as well. So even all of those, you can get into to the, to the um, program here, the BSc. Um, even if you did Roy Tech associate degree as well, any IT qualification you may have done, right? Once it's equivalent to an associate degree or diploma, ideally you should be able to get into the final year, good? So just a note as well, of course, the university is the one who makes the decision about where you start also, but it generally be consistent with in terms of who they accept and at what level. Now, we also have the bridging program, as I mentioned, but a lot of students incorrectly think they have to start at the bridging program. And I want to explain something. You don't need to know anything in IT to start at level four, right? A lot of people said, well, I never did IT in secondary school and I need to go and do all of this before I start. And the answer is no, level four is your starting point. We assume you know nothing and we are going to teach you as though you know nothing in IT. So don't think you have to go and do a set of courses to start at level four. It's a misconception. Our role is to prepare you, right? So given that's the case, who then should go to the bridging program? Well, the bridging program really is ideal if a person is just straight out of CSEC. In fact, I have students who didn't even write CSEC yet. So I have a student who's in form five who applied, he didn't write any CSEC and he's starting the bridging program, right? So you don't need any CSEC passes. You can go straight you, you from secondary school. Ideally, these are for the younger students who are like 15, 16, 17, and they wanna get started early, they can start at, at the bridging program. But if you have work, whether you work as a cashier, a sales clerk, or whatever it is, an attendant, it doesn't have to be IT. You, you should be able to start at level four with some work experience. Good? Okay. So any questions so far about these guys? Are you okay with the information presented so far? Any question that you particularly have? All right. So we talked about each level and we also talked a bit about the, the entry requirements for each level, right? So based on that, let's look at what you're going to learn in each level. So the focus of each level. Level year one, you'll learn more introductory information. Like for example, you will learn about the computers, how computer work, you'll learn about hardware. You will also learn about um, the, the, how, the, how in terms of the program, how it prepares you for the career. So what one of the course will do as well, it will ask you to take a look at maybe a job that you want to do and be able to map the courses that will be able to help you, but also look at other things you'll need to do as well to prepare you for the course. Because we all understand that and employers don't just want a degree. They want people with a lot of soft skills as well. The ability to work in group, to be able to communicate, to be able to think independently as well, and to work with minimal supervision and things like those, right? To be able to be articulate, etc. So those are additional skills employers have. A lot of times program provide you with some of these, but some of these you will acquire as you go along and you can also do independently as well. So. Part of the level one course, year one course, is to help you to recognize some of those skills so that you can start preparing yourself for it, right? But apart from that, you'll be designing database solutions. You'll have access to Cisco Academy where you learn networking course. And here's what has happened. Cisco is also like our students get access to Cisco and at the end, they also, so they do two things. They have an exam to write on Cisco and when they pass it, they will get a Cisco certificate as well as a certificate. Um, they will also pass their unit as well with the university. And what Cisco did recently, all the students, because they have a Cisco account, Cisco gave them a set of free courses as well. So the value of that, of, of um, that those Cisco certifications worked out more than the cost of the degree because students were just basically using their Cisco, the fact that they, they got access to do a ton of courses on Cisco as well and gain a series of additional certifications, which is really a smart thing because at the end you want your resume to look really good as well. 
right? Apart from that as well, you learn programming as well. So you learn SQL, you learn also about Microsoft Access, Oracle, Java, and Python are some of the different things you'll work with. Python and Java focus mainly in, in, year, in level four, which is year one, okay? Now in year two, um, so what I'll do as well, I will, I will also look at your individual qualifications. So I saw the post as well there, right? So based on what you posted, it seems very likely you may be able to, to, to get into level six, depending once you have your, your IT suits as well, you should be able to get into year three. Worst case, you'll get into year two, right? But it looks very good for year three. Now, in terms of the level five, level five now will focus more on designing and building applications, right? So you learn more about designing software, designing interfaces and stuff like that, as well as you have to learn some coding as well. And in final year, you will also learn project management more on, on building, because you have to build a design systems as well as build further application. A lot of people see the name BSc in IT and think, well, I'm not going to learn how to build right programs, but programming is infused within this in each of the different levels. So you are going to learn coding, Java, Python, you learn PHP, you learn SQL, and you're going to use Oracle Apex as well to develop applications also. So you're learning a range of tools. Honestly, the program is very good in equipping you with all those different skills as well. And in year three, you're going to develop more independent solutions where you could choose what you want to design, what you want to build, etc. Whereas year two, they will tell you what to do. Year three, you get to choose more, right? So that's a bit about what you will cover. Now, this is how it is covered here. So you have the bridging program consists of one subject, which is worth 30 credits. Level four is made up of four units. And those four units here, each worth 30 credits. And every level, they are 30 credits. Each course is 30 credits. And what you'll find as well, just to note here, a course may consist of two different things. So for example, in computer system structure, one half of the course, they do these they're learning databases, normalization, and all of those. ER diagrams, etc. And on the other half of the course, they they're doing the Cisco networking as part of the course. So even though you have four units, these units cover multiple things. So what you'll find is typically most awarding bodies, a course is very is singular and it covers one one main topic. In their program, most courses cover multiple things. And because of that, now you're learning a variety of skills. Now, the advantage of it just being packaged in four courses is because the fewer the course, the lower your tuition fee. So, so if they have just four units, you only have to pay for tuition for four units. If it was eight units, because the, if they had split it up into eight, then you'll have to pay for eight subjects, which will increase your cost. So they reduce the number of units to reduce the cost to the person. Good. So these are some of the things you will cover in the different levels four subjects, but you're doing two at a time. Each semester you're doing two, and then the next semester you do the other two. So that's typically how it will work. Now the question to you, to those who are busy and working with family and stuff like that, how will this fit into my busy lifestyle? Because I don't really have a lot of time. Well, the good thing is, is that first of all, there are three intake periods. So the next intake period is just a couple months away, worst case. In your case, it's next month. So our next intake is June, and then we have one in October, and then another one in February. So if you miss an intake, there's another one coming up soon, right? And so every four months, we have a new intake. But here's how the units are delivered. Each subject is a two-hour session once per week. Most of the cases, the classes are on Saturday. Now, I'm saying that, please note that at, from time to time, we may have a class, we may have classes on an evening based on, based on availability, like lecture availability. So for example, my aim is always to get the best lecture for the student. And if the best lecture is not available on a Saturday, then that class will be held on an evening. But Alex, I'll, I'll go through all of those with you as well. So each subject usually has one two-hour class for the week. Classes are typically on a Saturday, right? With very few exceptions. Apart from that, the, each unit or each subject is assessed via two to three assignments. Most cases, it's two assignments. Some cases, you may have more, right? Apart from that, the semester runs for roughly 15 weeks, right? And there's a two-week break typically at the end of the semester. So whenever you submit your last assignment, you'll have a break. Good. Now, so if you're doing, now you are doing two subjects at a time. So that means really you're committing to four hours of classes for the week. That's not bad at all, is it? So four hours of classes for the week, in most cases that four hours is on a Saturday. Here's the other thing. 
the classes are all online and it is our intention to remain online. Of course, we need to get the relevant approvals, et cetera, but I don't see us coming out of COVID soon, right? Please, I'm not preaching doom and gloom. I'm just saying that it may be a while before we get to a point where people are comfortable to go back to face-to-face -to -face classes, et cetera. So likely you would have finished the program and the class will be online. Our intention is to remain online. We've seen a growth in the program through the online offering as well. Now, the other benefit of the online classes is that all the classes are recorded and you have access to all the recording of the classes as well. So you can play back the recording over and over, whether you came to class, whether you missed class, you have access to the recording, you have access to the lecture notes, et cetera. Now, apart from these, if you have an assignment, we will do additional support for your assignment. We will conduct additional classes and support. So for example, my students in level four, they have a, an assignment you, and Often we are working with them, like in the, we are working with them on, apart from the class and teaching session, we do additional session with them to get them prepared because at the end of it, look, you know, we, our aim is to get you to do really well. So we do additional sessions to prepare you doing tutorials, et cetera. Good. This is an example of a timetable. So in this timetable here, you would notice that you have like, you have a class on Saturday. The, you have two on, these two on Saturday for level four. These two on Saturday for level five, level five. So level four might be eight to 12, 30. Level five might be 10, 30 to 245. Now in level six, this, I'll have to update this because new students will be doing two and continuing students will be doing two, right? But in level six, there's just one thing. There is the undergraduate project, which is your thesis module, right? But you could only do that in your final semester. So what you typically find happening is that we'll have one module and your, your, your project related module in one semester. And then in the other semester, when you go to your second semester, you, you will do the second part of the project module and, that, and another one. So you're doing four modules in total, but you're doing two in one semester, two in the other. So in level six, I will, uh, when I send you your timetable, you'll be doing two modules in level six, right? And two might be on Saturday or one might be on Saturday, one might be on the evening in order to allow students. So what we do, we allow you to sit in all the units. So even though you might be doing just these two this semester, we allow you to sit in all of them, and I'll explain why. I've often found that students who are entering directly into level six, they might be a bit more challenged with programming. And because they might be challenged with programming, what we've done, I, I allow you from your very first um, semester in level six to sit in, in the programming class, right? No extra course or anything. And to start building your application from your very first semester. The reason is, is that if you get the experience of doing so, when you get to your second semester, when you actually have to develop your thesis and to submit, you would have be repeating that subject again. And you would have gained a lot more experience as well because students may come in with work experience, et cetera, and may have not done programming before. So this is how we try to provide additional support and stuff to get you ready with your project, right? In fact, this year students did have some really exciting projects and some really nicely designed ones as well. Now, in terms of assessment, now, how will students assess? Now, your assessment may take different forms. You may be assessed via a coursework, which we call an assignment. So you're basically given an assignment like five or six weeks before, and you have about five or six weeks to complete it. Yep. Some you might be given at the beginning of the semester, but it's not due until we're done at the end of the semester. You may have individual assignments or group assignments. Some cases you may have to do a portfolio of work, like you may have a series of small things to do and you compile them together to basically now um, submit as your portfolio. In level four, you have a couple of essays to do. You may have presentations to do, and I love the presentations and I'll tell you why. The presentation is where you are basically presenting like a newscaster presenting what you would have done. And, and the reason for it is because it really helps to develop students' confidence level to be able to face like a, um, a, a someone like the coordinator, the unit coordinator, one of those, and basically they're going to ask you question, interrogate you on the work that you've done. It's nothing difficult. So their role is not to make it difficult, it's to make you at comfort and at ease. But at the same time, it is about helping you to be able to articulate and express what you've done. A lot of times students feel that look, they remain very quiet. And when they go to work, employers don't want to hire them because they're not very expressive. They're not able to communicate, et cetera. And I found that the presentation really helped to establish students' creative skills, as well as their public speaking and their assertiveness, et cetera. And of course, in some instances, more so in year one, you might have an exam, okay? So those are some of the things we'll cover. So that's a bit, bit of what will be covered in the different years. Now, 
at the end of the module, right, the pass mark is 40. So to pass a module, once your total mark is 40 or more, you pass the module. If, however, you got less than 40 marks, then you don't fail as yet. What will happen is that, so you get your mark, you did not score, if you scored 40 or more, you pass, fantastic. If you scored less than 40, what the university do, does, they have something called a referral system. A referral system is a way of forgiving students. So it, they give you another assignment to do or to improve on a previous assignment you did. And once you pass the referral module, then you pass the unit. If, however, you, you fail the referral, then you fail the unit and you have to repay and repeat the unit. So failing a unit, first off, when you get your, do all your assignments, if you had failed it, you don't fail the unit automatically. You're given a, a second chance called the referral. And if you fail that referral, then you have to now repeat the unit and pay to do it again, okay? So that's a little bit in terms of how it works, okay? Um, no, Cisco is only for students in year one. So Cisco Academy is only for, if you're doing us um, one of the courses in year one, which is the computer system structure. So you wouldn't get it if you're in year two or year three. Sorry about that though, all right? Okay. So if you fail, then you have to repeat the course, right? So that is where the referral comes in. Now, apart from that, when you complete the program, now, now just one thing to note, to move from one year to the other year, you must have to progress from one year to the other year, you must have passed your, your units in the lower year. So just a note as well, because at the end of it, if you fail units, it could prevent you from moving forward, right? Now, when you are graduating now, what could you graduate with? So at graduation, you could come, you could graduate with a BSc IT with first class honors, with upper second class honors, lower second class honors, or third class honors. Now, the class of degree is based on a couple of things. If you enroll directly in the final year, then your class of degree is based on the best 90, the, 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 the three highest marks, right? But it must include the undergraduate project. So your dissertation module must be included in that, plus your other two highest marks. They find the average, and if the average is 70 or more, then you'll get first class honors. If it's in the 60s, you'll get upper second. If it's in the 50s, you'll get lower second. And if it's in the 40s, you'll get third class honors. Now, if you started from year one or year two, know the following. Your year one marks doesn't count towards your, your degree, right? Meaning it doesn't count towards the class of degree, sorry. You need to pass it, but it doesn't count towards the class of degree. Only from year two, your marks count towards your class of degree. So based on that, in year two, right, how it works is as follows. They take your best 90 credits in year two, which is your best three marks in year two, and they will be one third, it's weighted as one third, and then the best three marks in year three, which must include the project, they, that is two thirds of the weight, right? So basically a year two and your year three count towards the degree. If, only if you started from year one or year two, then your year two and year three grades count. If you started directly at year three, then only your year three grades will count, right? But the project, the undergraduate project must be included on your two other best marks. And if you did year two, then your best three marks in year two will also be included. Good. Now, I did tell you earlier on that CTS had won awards for our student support services. So I want to share with you about our student support services. Now, for many of you, right, now we've often, we've had students who've come to some other institution, and I'm sure a couple of our students may have gone to other institution as well. But often when you talk to a student, what they will tell you is that the support at CTS is really, really good. Our our support to me is one of the best support mechanisms. Even the accreditation council has recognized that and has awarded us for our student support services. And I'll share with you some aspects of our support, right? So for example, before you sign up, we don't just want you to sign up. We will conduct an information session. The information session is not about the special offer, which most people seem to come to the information session for. It is so important that you understand this program before you make a choice. As I indicated to you, there are many other programs as well, and you should try to find one that match the things you are looking for as well. But in terms of support, it's important that you know what you're getting into before you make a decision. It's like marriage. You don't want to marry someone and then realize, hey, I didn't realize marriage is like this, or having kids and realize, hey, this is the case, etc. Although I think kids are the greatest you know, but at the same time, everything you do, you have to, to know and understand what you're getting into. So please note as well, even if you take a new job, you need to understand what are the requirements of it, what are the things you may have to do, because at the end, you need to commit to it as well. 
So given that's the case, we have information session to support you, to help you to understand the program. Apart from that, even after this, we'll be collecting your application. We will go through it, review it, submit it to the university. We'll update you on the process. When you get back, when we get feedback from them, we update you on, on, the, on your acceptance. We will guide you in terms of how to complete the registration forms and stuff for the university. We collect that, send it back. Now, email is our main form of communication. But what we also do when you start classes, we also provide, we have WhatsApp group. Now, you don't have to be in the WhatsApp group, but I strongly encourage you to, because even though, yes, in the WhatsApp group, you'll have a bit of old talk and stuff, but it's about students. They're not seeing each other face to face. So the WhatsApp group is really a forum where you get to know each other because these are your classmates. These, these are your classmates. So they're all virtual now, but the fact is, you know, students share share and support each other like when assignment is due they will be offering peak on god but again with catching the tail with this anybody figured out how to be able to do this etc and students often supporting each other in as they go through the process but also to sometimes like students may, may have problems and other students are sol solving it for them we are also there to, to assist also and we are part of that process so we are also in the whatsapp group too but really what we're trying to do is like how wikipedia is where everyone adds to the content and that is what we're trying to create we're trying to create a body of knowledge where everyone adds to it, including the students as well right so Apart from the WhatsApp group, apart from your emails as well, we also, when you have assignments, we are working with you to help you with your assignments as well. We are coaching, guiding. We're not doing the assignment for you, but we are providing with all the tools you need to be able to help you to get through, right? Even some of my newer staff, they may not fully understand the importance of support, you know, because they simply think like even sometimes we've had teachers who believe, well, I teach it if they don't understand it, that's them. And we had to really, so we worked on training our lecturers to help them to understand the student side of it, because at the end, students learn differently. And the fact is, in our classrooms, we'd find that there are some really smart students, but there are also some students who are also very slow. And it's not to put them down. The fact is, is that we they are our responsibility so we have to be creative and how we support them and that is why we often have these additional sessions to support students so i'll share with you like an example my students have an assignment due um the following week and what we what i've been doing i've been meeting with them and even even this is a group assignment even the students in the group who are not performing i'm meeting with them one-on-one -on -one to help them because the group some members of the group think that's not my responsibility. You know, I expect them to be at a certain level and I understand that. But the thing is, is that our care is to care for all our students and not to let anyone feel cast aside. So what we do is we provide additional support going over the stuff to make sure that they fully understand holding their hands as they go through it. Of course, you have other students who are not willing to be part of that. You know, they if they, they some students, they, they don't access the help and they don't attend class, they don't view the recording. And that's only minority, but it does happen. And you wonder, why are you signing up if you're not going to do any of these? They don't check their emails. They don't, so, so you know, like a lot of these things they miss out on because they, they're simply just signing up for a program, but they're not bothering with anything. And at the end, they miss assignments. And the problem is, I want you to understand, while it is your responsibility to submit the assignment, I want you to know how it impacts us. It impacts our pass rate because I want to be honest when I'm communicating my pass rate and it looks bad on me when a student simply chooses not to come to class, not to submit assignment, not to even your call to offer help, they're not taking part in it. And at the end, I have to record how to feel, but it wasn't because we failed to try. It was because simply the, the child failed. Now, I want you to note as well, we often involve parents as well, especially for those with younger kids. I get parents involved in the learning. So parents, please save my number. Please call me to get updates on your child as well, because... The reason is, is that, you know, I'm often finding the younger kids, the ones who have the most amount of free time, what they do, they miss classes because they are staying up late into the night, yes, which is not a problem, but they have online playing games and stuff, and they're missing their only class of the week. So you have two classes on a Saturday, and you're missing it, and you have, you're not working, you're home all day, and those are the students who are missing the classes. The, the bulk of our absent students are those who are not working, who are simply staying up playing games and stuff and missing classes. Whereas the person who is working, have a family to look after, doing homework with their child, finding time in the night to study, and then go to work the next day, and they will be in class. But yeah, the ones who have all the free time are the ones who miss classes because they basically 
in their online social life, online and missing classes, the one, two hour class, the, the, the four hours of classes they have for the week, they miss it. So those are some challenges we have. So I'm trying to inveigle parents to get more involved with us because what we do, we look at absenteeism, we inform parents, we get students involved because we want to know why you're absent because at the end, when you don't do well, it impacts us and we want to do other programs with the university. And if our results are not very good, it could impact us from even furthering our partnership with the university. So anyway, so we do induction. So after you get ac accepted, we do an induction, right? To get you into the program. We do academic writing skills. We do Harvard referencing, et cetera. So we do a range of different things we go through as well. We, we go through it in terms of the requirements of being a student of the university, because you need to understand what your roles and responsibilities are. And then apart from that, you get a lot of support for the program with content, when you have assignments and stuff, when you need letters and stuff, you just email us, you get them, et cetera. We email it back to you, et cetera. You know, so we provide a lot of support. You have my phone number. I'm the owner of the institution and I give everyone my phone number because when you invest in CTS, you're investing in me and I have a responsibility for my student as well. So feel free to call me anytime. I don't, you know, like, you know, in terms of determining who I'm going to answer and who I'm not going to answer. If you call and you, you don't get me because I'm in an information session like this or teaching a class, you know, feel free to call back, but I'm very good at returning calls, right? In most instances, I do my best. Sometimes things do slip though. So I may have a, a, a situation where I may have forgotten or something. So you forgive me for those, but it's not deliberate or inten intentional. And of course, you'll have online access to journals and other articles as well to read to help you in your preparation. Now, please note as well, apart from what the university does, CTS has our own environment where we have a shared drive with all the resources, lecture notes and stuff like that with the online recording, pass, pass assignments with samples as well available. So you could see what past students have done who did very well and those kind of thing, right? Now, apart from all of these, we also have an induction and the induction ceremony is where we introduce you to the course. You are now a student of CTS as well as the university. So we go through some rules and regulation. We go through how to do Harvard referencing to avoid plagiarism because now a lot of students are trying to cheat the system by simply copying and pasting stuff from, right? You are required to research, but you're required to use it in the right way to paraphrase. So we'll teach you all of those skills as well in the program, right? So we'll be conducting different workshops our lecturers are industry like these lecturers who practice what they teach. So therefore, in most instances, the person who's teaching you is a who is one who's doing that, that as their profession, right? They would have been a database programmer, they would have designed solutions, etc. So they are practitioners. So you're therefore getting industry experts teaching you in the er different areas as well. Of course, as a student of the university, you can also provide feedback as well. I have a very open door policy. So I give everyone, I tell them, call me directly. You don't need to form a union to come to me with a problem. Come directly to me, tell me. It doesn't matter if you need minority or whatever, because at the end of it, I want CTS to be an experience for everyone. So feel free to call and talk to me about whatever challenges as well. Now, parents and students, if you're looking at being part of this program, here's what resources you will need. Your classes are going to be online via Zoom, so you'll need access to resource to be able to be part of the classes. So you'll need internet access, but to do your assignments, to write programs and all of those things, you need to have access to either a laptop or desktop. Your phone is not going to suffice for many of the things that you need to do. So you will need to get a desktop or, or laptop. It will be ideal. A tablet would be useful, but at the same time, I generally recommend a desktop or laptop recommended best for the nature of the assignments that you'll have to do. Good. At the end, you can graduate in the UK as well as you could graduate. We our graduation ceremony is at higher typically, but because of COVID, you know, things have changed. We didn't have a graduation last year. What we did though, we had a like a ceremony where we took pictures with students. So we got them to come in at over a six hour period and we took pictures. So they had really good graduation pictures as well. Right. So graduation, normally you have it at the Hyatt, but you can go to both graduation in the UK as well as here. Of course, if you're going to the UK, it will be at your own cost for, for travel and boarding, etc. Right. Now we went through the entry requirements. So I'm not going to go through the entry requirements as, again, but what I'll do, right? If you're uncertain about where to start, call me. I'll give you my number again and I'll post it in the chat. Right. And so I'll go through those with you. Now, in terms of applying, here's what I want. Now, whether you're applying for the bridging or even level four, five or six, please consider the lower part, right? Complete the application form, which may have already been emailed to you, but I will email it at the end of the session. I'll email you the application form. 
please submit your resume. The reason is, is that if you have work experience, a lot of times students don't put their work experience, which could sometimes help them to get at a higher level or even from, move from bridging to level four, but they, they don't. So if you have any work experience included, so if you have a resume included, it's not mandatory, but if you include it, it helps us to help to better guide you. Now, the other thing is, if you started a program and you dropped out, please include it as well. Like you went to UE and you did one year UE and you drop out or you started an associate at Costa, you did a, a year and a half and you drop out, put those things in your resume because those things are helpful because it can help you to start at a higher level depending, right? Um, include your ID, your passport or your DP. It Make sure it's valid, right? It's a picture ID, but it's either a national ID, a passport or a DP. Make sure that it is valid and it hasn't expired, right? Okay, if you're using work experience, then ideally a letter from your employer will be helpful for the work experience. We don't need to see salary. We just want to see your position and the IT things that you did, right? And of course, if, if you did any academic qualification, you could probably send us a copy of your certificate or transcript if you have those, right? Okay, so a letter of completion is fine. If, you, if, you, if your certificate is not going to be available, a letter of completion and transcript will be helpful. And of course, if you did any IT certifications, if you can scan those and send it. Now you could use your phone to take good quality picture, but I want you to note, right? Sometimes people take some really ridiculous photos. I'm not trying to, um, you know, do this is not a name calling, but when you do, please understand, I have to send it to the university. So try to take a, if you could download a scanning app on your phone and you could get much better quality photos. So it looked like it was scanned, right? Alternatively, you could take a really good photo, but try to avoid ones where you're seeing shadow on it, where you're seeing a big glare on it, etc., which makes it a, render it a little bit, you know, like um, it's not a professional or, or good quality document as well that I, I could send up, right? So you could use your phone to take, proper pictures, et cetera, and you can send them to me. Now, in the application form, don't worry about printing and, and filling it out. You can fill it out on the computer. It has space for signature, but if you're having problems signing, don't worry about it at all. I'll reiterate, if you have problems signing the application form, don't worry about it, meaning that you don't need to print it out and do all of that. Just simply fill everything in soft copy because you don't need to come to the office, email everything to us, right? Because remember, the office is closed as well because of the whole COVID situation, right? Until the government advises where non-essentials can open back. So the office is closed. We only open when we have exams, right? So, so we'll be open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this coming week because we have exams. But other than that, the office is closed, right? So send everything on soft copy. If, and if you want, you could send me a picture with your ID. I'll take the extract, the, the signature from your ID and I'll insert it on the form. So I'll help you out in terms of those as well. If you're having any challenges with this stuff, let me know and I will work with you. So you make sure you take my number and liaise with me as you fill out this stuff. So I'll guide you and help you to do it as well, right? So what's going to happen after you apply? So after you apply, here's what's happened. You complete your forms, you send it to CTS. We will vet the form. Once the forms are complete, we send it to the university. After we send it to them, normally they take a two weeks or so to respond. They will, when they respond, they will, and they accept you, everyone gets accepted, right? So the question is which level you'll get accepted for. So there's no rejection, you get accepted. Now, one thing to note though, if you are currently in another course of study, right? The university ideally would not want to see you doing two programs at the same time. So if you're currently enrolled in another course of study, my recommendation is to exclude that or exclude that from the, the document because the university wouldn't want to approve you if you, if you are doing two programs at the same time, ideally, because they think you may not be able to handle it, right? So anyway, the when they accept you, they will send us a letter of offer. We will email you that letter of offer informing you you have been accepted at whatever level and you need to complete these documents and send it back to us. When you send back those documents to us now, then those will be a registration form and acceptance that you're starting, et cetera. Then what we do, we don't automatically send it to the university. What we do instead, you'll need to come in and you can do it online as well. You can register and pay for the course, right? You could pay in part or you could pay in full. And then after you've started paying and registering, then we send it to the university. After they've gotten it now, then they will assign you a username and password for Brio. And after that, then you will be, you, well, you, our classes will start. You will have access to Brio. And then, well, we'll have our induction on the 19th of June. And then on the 26th of June, classes start, 
good? So that's basically the process, right? It's a 10 step process we put it into, good? Now, in terms of cost now, let's quickly run through the fees for the program. In terms of the fees, this is the full cost for the level. Now, we are not paying this upfront, you, but I'm going through the full cost and I'll break it down for you into semester payment as well as monthly payment. So in terms of the full cost, right? In bridging program, there's one unit. So registration fees 500, tuition is $2,000 and the university fees is 150 pounds. In level four now, which is year one, there are four units. It's 500 pound, 500 TT to register for the semester, but you're doing it in two semesters. So in one semester, 500, in the next semester, 500. Your tuition fee is $2,000 per subject and there are four subjects. So 8,000 altogether. And the university fees is 150 pounds by four subjects. So that's 600 pounds. But it's, remember, this is for the whole level, right? The fees you're seeing here is for the entire level. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to break it down for you by semester, right? So notice this is for the full level. Let's break it down now by semester, right? So if you're paying per semester, this is how it works. You're doing well bridging it would not change but in level four you're doing two units in your first semester it's 500 to register it's 2000 by two units which is 4000 for tuition and 150 by two units which is 300 pounds so this is your first semester fee level five it's similar 500 to register 2250 for per subject by two which is 4500 and 300 pounds to the university and level six is 500 to register 2500 per subject by two which is 5000 and it's 375 by two to 750 pounds to the university. So these are the fees for the per semester. Now, these fees now could be paid monthly and I'll show you how. Now in paying monthly, the tuition fee now is simply take your tuition and divide it into four months. The university fees, unfortunately, I because I have to pay that early on, I need to get this fee early on from you to pay. Because if you don't pay, I have to pay the university. So that's why I try to get this early so that I'll have the fees to pay the university because once they charge for the student, I have to pay if the student didn't pay me. And because of how many, how many challenges I had with that before, with students not paying, right? We request now that students pay early on, right? Um, by the start of the semester, the university fees, good? All right, so continuing as well. This is the monthly payment option. And the monthly payment option, we simply take the, the tuition and the we take the tuition here and divide it into four, right? So I'll provide you my phone number as well. Shortly, my phone number, I'll just call it out, but I'll put it on the chat as well. It's 777-1294. And when I email you, it will be on my email as well. At the bottom of the email has my email signature. So in my email signature, you'll see my phone number, right? Which is my cell number, good? All right, so in terms of this here, your, if you're paying with the payment plan, it's the tuition is, is 2,000, it's so you divide that by four, it's 500 each month. For level four, it's 2,000 per subject. So if I divide that by four, it's 500 per subject per month. So 500 per subject, so you're doing two subjects, so that's 1,000 per month. And here you do it similarly as well, right? Okay, so 562.50 per unit per month, and you're doing two units at a time, and 625 per month per subject, so multiply that by two. So this is what the monthly payment looks like. This is paid up front, and if you could pay this up front, that would be great as well, all right? If you can't, lease with me, and I'll see what, what exception I could make for you, right? For the university fees. Okay, so if there are any problems with the university fees, let me know, and I'll see what exceptions can be made for you. So we have a special offer for you guys. And with a special offer, you can get up to $1,000 off per level. Well, except for the bridging level, you get 250 off per unit. So basically you get 250 off per unit. So here's how you could qualify for 250 off per unit, right? To do that, right? You must submit all your documents to me by the 21st of May, which is next week, well, Friday coming, right? Next Friday. So I need to get your application with your supporting document by Friday, 21st of May. That doesn't seem too bad, right? And if you have any problems, let me know. And the registration, tuition, and university fees must be paid by in full by 12th of June. And once you do, you can get up to five, well, 500 a semester. And, and then next semester, you do the same thing again. You pay before the start and you get another 500. So that's a thousand per level. Good. So that's how you can qualify for your special offer. So you can get up to a thousand dollars off the level, right? If you pay, complete your stuff and pay, pay your semester fee for this semester, 
right, by the 12th of June. Good. So when can you start? Our next start date is on the 26th of June is our next start date. So guys, any questions or anything that you guys may have? Question, comments, anything you guys would like to make? No, I think I'm fine for now. No problem. Um, please remember to take part in the survey. I've just posted the survey link again to you all. So please take part in the survey. The survey link has been posted. So kindly take a look at the survey. It's just to answer a question in terms of how you found out about CTS, right? So please, about the information session, so please do take part in the survey as well. I, I don't know if there are any further questions you guys have. If not, what I'll do, later today, I'll be sending out an email with the recording from the session. Now, just in case as well, right, you would have had to register with your email address. So whatever email address you provided is what we'll send it to. If you didn't get an email, it's probably because an invalid email was submitted to us as well. But we'll be sending out email with the recording and with the lecture, with the notes from this, this session as well. You should get it in just over two and a half hours because I have to convert it and then upload it to YouTube and then send the link. So in within two to three hours, you should get the information. All right. And yes, you can claim for this course via tax return, right? So the foreign fees can be claimed via tax return, right? Or oh, about books. Right now, in terms of the, the books, what we've done is we've gotten a, a series of PDF versions of the books and it's available on a share drive that we make available to you. So you, you ideally should not have to purchase any books at all because all of them should be available in e-copy as well. Okay, so all of the books are, are, are available in soft copy, right? Right, the digital badges you can use as well. I think I'd answer that to you in an email as well. Um, the digital budgets can be used as well. So you can you can use those. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you can use your digital badges. All right, okay, no problem. Now, whatever operating system, you need to be able to, to ensure that you can get like software to run on the system, right? So if you're using Java or you're using Python or any of those coding languages, you have to be able to run on your system, right? Um, so once it can, then that's fine. You can use any operating system. Cool. All right. So guys, if there are no more questions, then I'm, I'm here if you need to ask anything as well, right? You can have a further one on one with me, and you have my number. My number is 7771294. Feel free to call me to discuss. You could call me on WhatsApp, you could call me on regular phone, and we can have a discussion as well regarding any specific questions that you may have. Now, actually, what I would like to do, if it's okay with you, I'll quickly show you how to fill out the application form because a lot of students think that the application form is more difficult than it is. And I want to show you quickly how you can fill out the application form. So give me a second. I'm just going to pull up the application form to show you how you can fill it out. So just give me one second to get that application form for you. All right, so this is your application form. If you cannot get your signature here, don't worry about it. You can simply take a picture, paste it. If not, just send the document with all the signature. And once you have, we have the ID or any of those which is signature, we could get, we could pull it from there and put it on the form for you. Right? You choose male or female accordingly. You put your date of birth to the side here, right? Yeah, the, the date, the month, and the year, right? Then you put your first name here, just your first name. If you want to put your middle name, you can, but your last name goes here. Now a couple of times students for their family name, they, they listed all the members of their family, but that's not what family name means. Family name simply means your last name. So simply put your last name here, right? So this is your last name here, your first name here. And if you have any middle names, you can put it on the, with the same line with your first name. Now, previous family name is for persons who may have gotten married and changed their name. So this is your maiden name, or if you had a previous name, if you change your name. Don't worry about the passport number and country, you can leave this out. So leave this out here your correspondence address, you put it here. If you, if you also have a home address that is different from where you get your letters, then you put your home address here. But you don't need to repeat it if it's the same. So you can just follow out here alone. 
next right ignore postcode you you could put a telephone like this is your home phone or if you have two cell phones or you you or, you, or an alternative contact you could put it here right just in case we don't get through this is your mobile number here ideally and this is an alternative number to reach you as well this is your email but please when you're sending your stuff please make sure you send it from this address the reason is is that sometimes people put an email address here but they send us email from another address and then when we check this is an invalid address so I prefer if you, you always communicate us from the email address that you're using here, right? Whichever email address that you communicate from regularly, please use that email address here and use that to send us your stuff as well. The reason is, is that we have people who give us one address here, but communicate us on a different address. And when we email them back, we're emailing them on the address they provided on the form and they're saying, well, I do, didn't get it, I, et cetera. And that's because they're not checking the email address they provided on the form, okay? All right, so that's it for the first part. If you have criminal conviction, you put yes or no accordingly. Of course, you can just put a little box with X here next to it. You'll indicate your country of birth, which is Trinidad or wherever you are born, or any country, your nationality might be Trinidadian, as the case may be, and country of domicile is where you're living right now. So if you're currently in Trinidad or in the US or UK, you put it here, right? We do have students outside of the country in the program as well. Are you currently resident UK? For all of these, you can simply put no for all of these if you wish, or if your answer is different, you can. How would you pay? Self-funded. Self-funded means you or your parents will be paying for it as opposed to some, the government or so, right? This part of the form is, should be automatically filled out. When I send it to you, it will automatically have our information, so you don't need anything there. Now, in this one here, this is where you put the level. So BSCIT, it's the undergraduate. Here, you need to put the level like year one, level four, or year two, level five, or year three, level six, as the case may be. So please put the level that you want to start over here in this section here. And then your entry, you'll put, well, in your case, it won't be September. Your entry now will be Ju um, June 2021, right? So your entry will be June 2021. So just to, to know there, so I'll probably just change that there. So, right? So if I were to edit text here, this should be June 2021 rather than September 2020. This is June 2021. Good. All right. Next. Nothing here, but this is one of the most critical section. This is what they're going to use to assess your application to determine where you're going to start. So based on that, if you did CXE, you don't need to put one row per subject. So if you did CXE, notice how you do it. So secondary, when you started secondary, when you finish, and you put what year you, you, you got your certificate, right? The awarding body is CXC, not your high schools. Your, your high school didn't award you the certificate. The CXC awarded the certificate. So the awarding body is CXC. And put like six CXC passes. I don't need to get the grades and stuff. You can put how many passes you have. So one line, if you did the CXC. If you did A-levels or CAPE, another line, one line, you could put that if you wish. If you did certification courses like A+, plus, et cetera, you put IT as the, as the program of study, right? Or A+, plus if you want. The year you started and finish, right? The awarding body might become TIA, or if you did it at CTS, et cetera, right? You could put those, right? And then apart from that, you put um, the, the, so if you did the certificate from CAMTIA, you'll put CAMTIA there, right? You'll put A+, plus or whatever the certification is called as the case may be. If you did other certifications, you could include them accordingly. Let's say you did an associate degree at UTT or Costa to one of those, then again, you could put IT as the case may be. You start NDA, et cetera, right? You put the awarding body like UTT, Costa, et cetera. You put your qualification, which is a diploma or operator, uh, associate degree. Now, even if you're incomplete, you could put like you were doing a BSc, you did the up to year two incomplete. So year two incomplete, so you're basically saying you were doing a BSc in IT, but you, you, you reach up the year two and you were incomplete. So this is how you put incomplete stuff. So this is an idea how to fill in your qualifications. At all times, preference for your IT qualifications and then your non-IT, right? Okay, good. Next, for this section here, you could put whether, if you did your English qualification, you could put none because if you didn't do IELTS, et cetera, you could choose none and then put CXC English. Now, one thing with the form you're filling out, all of these here, the challenges, it repeats in all of them. Don't worry about that. That's an error in the form, right? So don't worry if when you're filling out the form, the same thing shows up three times. That's an error with the form. Here now is where your work experience could help you as well in the program. If you have any IT work experience, 
please include it, right? And with the most recent ones first, and then after. But if you don't have IT work experience, but you have general work experience, please include it as well. So if it's non-IT, still include it on the form, please. Good? So you put your work experience, you put your job title, the company name, when you started. And if you're currently there, you put the present or current and full-time or part-time as the case may be. If you work from 2016 to 2019, you can include that accordingly as well. Next, do you have any physical disabilities? A yes or no simply would work. How did you hear about us through an agent or, or through a website or however, you could put it here as well. And for the referees, you put two referees, you must put two referees. Now, the thing is, is that fair referees, we don't need to fill all this stuff. You can put a name, a phone number and an email. Um, they don't really contact the referee, so you don't really have to worry. And the referee don't have to do any form report or anything like that. You simply need to put the information. It could be a someone from your church, a senior member from your church, someone in your community, someone from your workplace, or your parent, good friend who may have a senior position. Ideally, those are the type of persons that you may want to include. But please include two names and, and phone numbers or email addresses of your referee. And then at the bottom, you can insert your signature if you can. So you submit this to us along with a scan copy of either your, your national ID or passport, right? Preferred or your DP if you don't have those or they're not valid. Then if you're now, please note your name on your certificate must match the, um, the, the name that you're applying for. If not, then you have to use like, if there's a change in name, if you could support it through a marriage certificate, et cetera. So please note if for any reason, the name on your on your application form doesn't match the name on your ID, then use a marriage certificate or something to show the change in name, good, right? And um, apart from that, any copies of certifications, any copies of job letter, if using work experience or any copies of IT qualifications as well will be helpful. Even if you're, you're incomplete with a program, please still send the transcript like an IT program in particular because it will show that you at least did the program, cool? So those are some of the things you need. And any other question, feel free to call me, 777-1294. That's 777-1294 if you have any further questions, okay? So that's it for now, guys. And I'm signing off from here, okay? You have my number, feel free to call if you have any other questions. I'm sticking around though for persons with individual questions as well, right? If you wanna ask, okay? So thank you very much. Thank no, you, sir. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you for your time. Yeah. You're most welcome. All right. Oh, by the way, the form will be emailed to you all as well. So I will email the form to you guys. All right. And additionally to that, um, if you did a technical communication engineering diploma at John D at the time, all right? How do you fill the form? Okay. So if you did something at John D, just to answer that question, all right? If you are done. Can I ask just one little question? Sure. Uh, uh, the thing is, I, I, I am now from Trinidad, right? And I'm working here in Trinidad, delivering a professional service for an international company. And I have access to all my certification because they are digital, right? And also because I have to submit the, the renewal for the work for me, I, I also have some diploma certification in digital, but to get the, 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 the correct documentation that I was at the university in my country, but I don't finish, can be taken a little more time. I, I would like, it will, if I submit all the certification and diplomas, plus the words, it will be sufficient. Right. If they're in English, then it won't be a problem. So if you have just scanned copies, I don't need originals. Once you can submit scanned copies, that would be fine, right? And whatever you can get. So if you what, you can still put in what you've done, even though you may not have copies of them. So the ones you don't have copies of, you could still include them in here in this section, right? But the ones that you do have, if you can include those, if it's not in English, if you could get it translated to English, that would be helpful because the university would not be able to use the non-English ones because they won't be able to recognize what it's saying. So yeah. if you could get them translated. Yeah, they, they are in English because they are for, for global certification. And that should, then that should be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If you're a John D, then in that case here, yeah, the institution will be John D. You put the, the, the qualification like um, telecommunication engineering technician, so you can put telecommunications here, right? You put your start and the end here, here. When you got a certificate, John Donaldson Technical Institute goes here. And you can put the name here like um, 
EET or whatever is the qualification, right? That's what you will be filling out. All right, any other question as well? Thank you, thank you. And thank you very much guys for attending today's session. Have a wonderful day. See you guys.